Welcome to episode 12 of Red vs. Blue. My name is Mike Stark. And I'm Keith Curry. And we are back following the New Hampshire primary. What did we find out, Keith, in that primary? Well, we found out that Nikki Haley is a strong second, but not quite strong enough. Trump won the uh, primary with 54% to her 43%, so it was 11-point margin. She didn't get within signal digits. Trump was at 54. He was not held under 50. So uh, he sort of hit his numbers for what constituted a win. And he's going into other states now and into Super Tuesday, where he is ahead by more in the polls. She did clear the field of DeSantis, so he's gone. We're getting ready for a couple of weeks of pretty intense campaigning. So uh, advantage and victory goes to Trump, but not without warning signs. There were some significant warning signs. 43% uh, of Republicans, just like there was 49% of Republicans in Iowa, wanted somebody not named Trump. Independents, by a very wide margin, 58%, supported Haley and don't want Trump. He's got some very tough demographic wood to chop for a general election that's visible in the voting results in uh, New Hampshire. So does this mean that if uh, Haley somehow survives the storm and becomes the nominee, she could be a contender against Biden? She will be the prohibitive favorite against Biden. So all those Trump people will come over. Well, she'll have some problems. I mean, it's you know, she's got to pick somebody like a DeSantis to sort of get the MAGA base not to stay home. And, and mm. that'll be a big issue. Yeah. But uh, you know, 20 percent of the Republicans are never Trump. So, the, you know, those people will will be energized and she'll energize independence and she'll give Democrats who are worried about Biden and Biden's age and Biden's issues someplace else to go that they can feel comfortable where they would not feel comfortable with Trump. And that's basically the independent group, which is a large majority of voters. It is. And, you know, it's not we're not out of the woods yet for Joe Biden either. He's got some challenges that came out of out of New Hampshire. Thirty six percent of the people who showed up voted for somebody else. Now, you had to write Biden's name in. So it was more difficult to vote for Biden. But they had a very well organized campaign. That same situation faced Lyndon Johnson and, and, and Harry Truman in 1952, lost the, to Estes Keith Albert and got out of the race. He's got some warning signs as well. He didn't get a lot of independent votes. He had 36 percent of Democrats want somebody else. He's got some challenges. And he's, he's very constrained by the extremes on his party of what he can do. So Biden, how does he move forward from here? Biden moves forward by trying to very hard not make a mistake, by wrapping up the delegates early and by putting aside any of the Democratic disaffection so that he can turn first and try and run to the middle. Now, Biden has shown absolutely no inclination in any of his policies to run to the middle. The economy is improving, as we're seeing in some of the economic statistics, but it's still not being reflected very strongly in poll results. And part of that is, is that Biden's own policies are undermining him on the economy. He keeps wanting to raise taxes, saying everybody ought to pay their fair share. But what we now know is that if everybody in the Biden family paid their fair share, we wouldn't have as big a problem with taxes. <laughs> so he's got to deal with that. Here's how he keeps stepping on himself. Today, museums all across America are putting curtains up over their American Indian displays because the Biden administration has come out with a new policy that says you must have permission of the tribe before you can display anything of historical or cultural significance. So, for example, the Museum of Natural History in New York, one of the greatest uh, anthropological museums in the world, is covering up all of the stuff they've collected over hundreds of years, as is every other museum in America facing fines. Indians are saying, people asking us for permission, you know, that's going to create a financial burden for the tribes, meaning give us money and we'll give you, like, use our stuff. But, I mean, that's just a foolish policy that comes out of the wokeness that's sort of inherent in today's Democrats and that Joe Biden, despite the fact that he was the moderate in the primaries four years ago, right. continues to be unable or unwilling to overcome. Of course, Trump has his problems. We almost don't even need to discuss them because there are so many, but they don't seem to affect him quite as dramatically as any fumble that Biden makes. They haven't yet, but here's why there was this effort that flew apart after, you know, less than a day to sort of make him the presumptive nominee at the Republican Party. Trump wants very much for the Republican contest to be over. And the reason is because he knows he is getting ready to head into a season of discontent. Arguments ended today in the Eugene Carroll trial number two for damages. 
We expect a verdict any day now in the uh, business fraud trial, which were going to be hundreds of millions of dollars of damages. The trial on the hush money with uh, the stripper, Stormy Daniels, is getting ready to start. He's going to lose on uh, immunity. He's probably going to win and stay on the ballot in Colorado in May. But he's going to have a season of very, very difficult and challenging days in court. And what we're seeing with the way he attacks Nikki Haley's dress, how he storms in and out of the courtroom in New York, how he just goes on these midnight tirades on on Twitter or X, whatever they call it, it's getting to him. And just like Mm. the Democrats are so deathly afraid of Joe Biden making a mistake and saying something stupid or trying to shake hands with somebody not there, Trump's campaign people have got to wake up every morning going, what in the hell did he say last night? And how am I going to clean up the mess? Because he cannot help himself. Yeah, but in a lot of cases, some would say that all of this craziness helps him with his base, right? You know, I keep believing that there is a limit. (laughs) We haven't found that limit yet. How Uh, long has this show been on the air? It's been on too long for this to be still a problem. Let's just set the stage. Let's assume that Haley loses in South Carolina, but she gets 35% of the vote. We go to Super Tuesday. She sort of loses many of the states, maybe carries a couple. So now she's got between 35 and 45% of the delegates. Trump has got, you know, 55 or 65%. So it looks like he's going to win. He's probably presumptive to win, but he hasn't won yet. And now we're going to sit from March 5th until the conventions in July. And I found a quote, one of my favorite quotes from William Faulkner that I think sits the situation well. For every Southern boy, 14 years old, not once, but whenever he wants it, there is the instant when he is still not yet two o'clock that July afternoon in 1863. The brigades are in position behind the rail fence and guns are loaded and ready in the woods and the flags are furled. But it hasn't begun yet. It hasn't even happened yet. It not only hasn't happened yet, but there's still time for it not to begin against that position and those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Faulkner is talking about the Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. Sure. But that's what's going to be the case for Republicans. The army is at the line, to a lesser degree for the Democrats, too. They're facing the opposition. We know what's going to happen. He's going to get creamed. And it's still time for him not to be nominated. It's still time for the Republicans to uh, find a different alternative. But there's so much impetus that they probably are not going to be able to. And it's going to be a period of just absolute pandemonium in the country, just negativity, fear, and loathing. And what are some of the things that are going to happen then? There will be tremendous buyer's remorse. Some of these endorsers will sort of now want to back off. The campaign is going to be all court TV because that's going to dominate the news from the Trump side and maybe from the Biden side too with Hunter. Because neither side likes the nominees, we're going to see boomlets for third-party candidates the entire summer. Now, they all sort of fade in the stretch. But we're going to have a summer where if your name is Joe Manchin or Pat McCrory from North Carolina Republican or John Huntsman or Mitt Romney or anybody else who could be a viable, bipartisan, in-the-middle candidate, you will have your day in the sun. We will talk about that immensely. And what we haven't had until, well, we have had it, but we haven't had it to the degree we're going to have it now, is we will have foreign bots from China and Iran Mm -hmm. and Russia and Canada and some pimply-faced guy in the garage over some guy's house who are going to be sending out so much AI-generated misinformation. They'll have you know pictures of Joe Biden sleeping with horses. It's going to be (laughs) just made-up crap to a degree never before seen. And nobody's going to be able to discern the truth. I mean, we saw that they had a a fake robocall for Biden telling people to stay home in New Hampshire. So, I mean, that's what the battleground in the summer is going to look like. And it's going to be awful for America. But it's going to be great for this show. Well, there there will be news May. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, one of the issues that the recent issues that seems to be churning under is the border. Now, the border is not a new issue, obviously. I just watched a clip from, it was George H.W. Bush against Ronald Reagan. They were running, 1980, okay. They were running against each other in a primary, and a question was asked of them in the debate about immigration. And the tone of both of those candidates was, 
180 degrees different than the tone of any Republican that's speaking out today. Uh, There was empathy in their discussion, and there was a discussion of trying to work things out. Well, now we've got a situation, it looks like, where the Republicans have pulled the reins back on any negotiations because Trump wants to use the border as a talking point for his campaign against Biden rather than try and actually solve the problem. So what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Well, you're right. The the whole Republican and the national position, but the Republican position in particular has moved rapidly and very negatively from where it was in the 1980s and the 1990s. Some people will accuse Ronald Reagan of signing an amnesty bill when he was president of the United States. He couldn't get nominated in today's Republican Party. And the border is now beginning to rival the economy as the top issue on voters' minds. And in some places, it is the biggest issue Mm, on people's minds. And it would be an issue that would work for Republicans because Biden is sort of locked into where things he can and cannot do because of his base and because of his prior commitments and because of the legislative leadership that he responds to. Right. But you can't have, you know, refugee camps on the Texas border. That's why they have to be relocated to people who announced that they're wanted to be sanctuary cities. And by the way, in our California Senate debate, we saw two candidates say that we ought to have a right to housing. New York City's adopted a, a right to housing. That's why they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars putting people up and they've taken over entire hotels of refugees. That policy doesn't work. But the Republicans, rather than having a policy that will work, now have decided they're just going to do nothing and let the the great Donald come down from on high and, and I don't know, stop it with bandits. God only knows what he's going to do. He has no idea. And that is an advocation of leadership. And what's going to happen is they're going to take an issue on which Republicans could have you know run over the Democrats on, and they're going to show themselves to be inept at solving the problem at the congressional level. And they're going to throw that issue away. And the blame is going to go to Donald Trump for messing it up. Remember, Donald Trump said they should not adopt a budget deal unless they got every single thing they asked for. I mean, he's not interested in governing. He's not interested in preventing chaos. He's interested in causing chaos. And anybody that signs on to that agenda is going to get tagged with that, and they're going to be disadvantaged in the November election. This was discussed in a private meeting, but somehow got out. So if it had stayed private, they might be able to pull it off. But the fact that it's out there now does make the Republicans look like they don't want to govern. That's exactly right. And one of the ways it got out was that Trump tweeted it. I mean, he, you know, stepped on his own lines once again to make sure he got the credit. It's just absolute madness and foolishness. Uh, Republican senators who tend to be the more responsible uh, people in Washington are just beside themselves with this. It's going to prevent, because remember, what's backed up now is Ukraine aid and, and Israel aid. So this goes far beyond what the uh, immigration policy is going to look like. Sure. Uh, it's it's a national crisis. And of course, our adversaries around the world are just dancing with glee. Well, we've got a lot ahead of us, it looks like. We will be here, but we're going to take a couple weeks off because there's, a, there's sort of a gap in the uh, politics right now. They work the gap around my vacation, which is very nice of them to do. And then we'll be back in probably three or four weeks and things will be cranking up again because we got the uh, Super Tuesday and we got some other uh, primaries to go before the real craziness starts. That's right. South Carolina is coming up at the end of February. So pull out the hot sauce because uh, it's the kind of place. And by the way, you can vote. It's an open primary. So you can vote on either side in South Carolina. You know, it's a state where they have a reputation for no holes barred politics. So if you thought that Iowa was sort of, you know, conservative Christians and polite and New Hampshire is sort of New Hampshire nice and sort of stayed, you're, we're coming to South Carolina, baby. It's, it's going to be uh, William Faulkner would recognize the place. There you go. All right. Well, thanks again for uh, joining us for another edition of Red versus Blue. Please go to our Facebook page and like it. Subscribe to the podcast on any of the platforms, specifically Spotify and iTunes. And we will see you again in a few weeks. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening.